Hey brethren, today we're going to be reading in the Great Leaders of the Christian Church about Thomas Cranmer. You may not have heard of him, he's not as well known, but he definitely had some influence. He lived from 1489 to 1556. He's around the reforming period. Here's a picture of Thomas Cranmer. And here's the Lam Lambeth Church and Palace. Um, and then, um, here's Lambeth Palace in London, modern day. And then, here's the last picture of Sir Thomas More, who lived from 1478 to 1535. Um, he was Lord Chancellor of England. So, let's write in Thomas Cranmer, Ar Archbishop of Cranberry, is less, um, I mean, Archbishop of Canterbury, is what less well known than either Martin Luther or John Calvin. No denomination or form of theology is named after him. Yet his achievements as a quiet reformer in the Church of England and as a major architect of his liturgy and theological emphases do bear comparison with those men of Wittenberg and Geneva, especially when it is remembered that the liturgy he created had been pro has been the primary liturgy used for the fourth energy century in the Episcopal churches of the Anglican communi communion throughout the world. Cranmer's genius lies not in originality, but rather in taking the best from the Christian tradition of worship, theology, and ethics, and using that to create forms of worship and principles of theology to guide the Church of England as it sought to reform itself in the middle of the 16th century. He was a Protestant in that he protested on behalf of the sacred scriptures and the way they were interpreted in the church of the six first six centuries. He did not want to introduce novel ideas, but to preserve and conserve that which God has graciously given to the universal church over the centuries, and especially before the major corruptions that began, as he believed, in the 12th century. Thus he understood his own religious and theological quest to be for, quote, true Catholicity, end quote, in what he sought to implement in England may well be called Reformed Catholicity. It was thorough based upon inspiration and authority of the Holy Scriptures and included a respect for tradition reflected in the maintenance of a Reformed and renewed liturgy and of the old threefold order of ordained ministers, deacon, priest, and bishop. Thomas Cranmer in the Making of Anglicanism by Peter Toon Cranmer the Erastian Thomas Cranmer was born in Nottinghamshire in England in 1489, and after attending a local school, he went to Jesus College, Cambridge, as a student. He received a traditional education based on the Latin language and classes. Classics, sorry. He proved himself such a good scholar that he was elected a fellow of the college in, in 1523. For a short time, he had to relinquish that position when he married. However, his young wife died in, died in childbirth, and he was able to return to his former position. He was careful, methodical, and penetrating in his study of theology, and made full use of the insights and brought by the, quote, new learning, with the emphasis on, upon studying the Bible in the original languages rather than the Latin translations. During that period of study, reflection, and meditation in Cambridge, Cranmer adopted an important principle— he rejected the claims made by popes and by the others on their behalf that a pope had jurisdiction throughout Christendom as the vicar of Christ. He came to believe that the ruler of each country, which meant the king of England, had the power to govern the church. For papal supremacy, he substituted royal supremacy, and thus is known as an Erastian. Later, this principle placed him in difficult moral dilemmas. For example, when... As archbishop, he had asked he had pro to provide the legality for the acquisition and dismissal of several wives by Henry of the Henry the Eighth, and during the reign of Mary of Tudor, who wanted to restore the old medieval Catholicism, he eventually had her decide to decide whether to obey her or to follow what he believed to be God's truth. He chose the latter and declared that in the last resort, the truth of salvation is above the truth of royal supremacy. It was also in his study at Cambridge that he became acquainted with the Lutheran doctrine of justification by faith alone. In this, in, 
and this he diligently examined and pe- um, compared with a traditional medieval, medieval view that justification is a process leading to a declaration of righteousness at the last judgment. Later, as archbishop, he was to declare his commitment to justification by faith alone and to make valiant attempts to incorporate this biblical doctrine into the confession of faith and forms of worship into the Reformed Churches of England. Archbishop Cranmer With minimal experience um, of parish and diocesan, diocesan duties, Cranmer was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury by Henry VIII in 1532. During the previous three years, he had pleased the king by advice he had offered concerning the way to dissolve the marriage of with Catherine, Catherine of Aragon. The offer of this, mo- this important position came as a surprise both to Cranmer and those in high places. During the next 24 years, chiefly in the reigns of Henry of the Eighth and his son, Edward the, Ed- Edward the Sixth, however, he did much to advance the cause of the reform of the Church of England. What he attempted to implement reveals that he had thought deeply about all aspects of the life and teaching of the church. His time was short and his adversaries many, but what he had achieved, as we look back, a permanent quality about it. His most outstanding achievement was the the fixing of the church's liturgical order. Out of the many books of the medieval worship and prayers, he created the Book of Common Prayer in the language of the people. Instead of an assortment of Latin books containing a variety of services, he provided the church with one book containing all the serv- all services for daily, Sunday, and occasional use, as well as the book of Psalms and the lectionary for the, home, for the whole year. The service of the Holy Communion especially reveals the ability of Cranmer as both a theologian slash liturgist and a writer of English prose. It contains in an English style that is more attractive today, the Reformed Catholic understanding of both the Lord's Supper and the justification by faith alone. This book of common prayer has been of immense importance in the history of both the Church of England and the Anglican Communion of the Churches, and is still widely used today, despite the appearance of alternate books in recent decades. The 42 Articles Another Another achievement was an influential part in the fixing of the doctrine, doctrinal anchors of the Reformed Church of England. These are found in the 42 Articles of 1553, later shortened to the 39 Articles of 1571. They anchor the Church to the Scriptures, the Creeds, and to the Reformed Catholicity. They, thus, they rejected medieval and papal errors and heresies on the one side and the excesses of the radical reformers on the other. Though the status of these articles differs from one another, um, and differs from one part of the Anglican communion to another, they are everywhere still held to be the authoritative, still held to be authoritative rather, in a manner, in a major or minor way, especially for establishing um, um, Anglican doctrine. Other plans and efforts of Cranmer, though admirable, did not come to fruition in those troubled times. He set in motion the work of reforming the inherited church law, canon law, and his work, and it, I mean rather, his commission for which he died the ma- which for which he did the major work, produced an order coherent and intelligible body of ecclesiastical law. It brought rationality into the relig- new religious situation of the royal supremacy in the church, but was not implemented until 1604, long after his death. Further. He had all kinds of plan for the formation of an educated ministry of godly and learned men because so few of the priests of the church had ever preached a sermon and the people rarely heard the exposition of the Bible in the parish churches. The plans came to nothing, but at least he did see the publication of a book of homilies in 1547, thereby providing sermons that could be read in churches. Three of the homilies were by Cranmer himself. Finally, we may note um, Cranmer's ecumenical spirit. He greatly desired to see much more cooperation between the new churches of the Reformation and a greater effort by the leaders um, to find a common way forward together. He had little success in promoting this vision. Most of his achievements occurred in the brief reign of Edward VI, although 
the seed had been sown and the preparations made in the reign of Henry VIII. It was in the latter reign, um, latter's reign that, the Cran that Cranmer played his part in the provisions of copies of the newly translated English Bible in all the parish churches. In the reign of Mary of Tudor, he was accused of high treason and sent sentenced to death, but the queen spared his life. Then he was tried again for heresy and sen sentenced to death again. He died at the stake on March 21st, 1556. In his final statement, he affirmed his rejection of Roman Catholic doctrine contrary to the word of God, and then placed his hand, the hand by which he had earlier written to state that he accepted such doctrine, into the fire that it should burn first. He died as a martyr for the English form of Reformed Catholic Christianity. So, this is another great story of a reformer, um, and... Sorry I stumbled a lot, but you might notice that a lot of these reformers faced opposition, and well so, because people don't like the truth, and that's just how it is, and it should inspire us and encourage us in our faith to be ready for all sorts of persecutions, however the may Lord may will. So God bless you guys, in Jesus' name, amen.